a letter from the late Reverend Mr. Berridge of Everton to a clergyman of the Church of England. 3rd July, 1758, Reverend and Dear Sir, As I believe you to be desirous of knowing the truth yourself, and of bringing souls to the truth, I take the liberty to acquaint you with the wondrous things which God hath done for my soul and the souls of my people, and in order to this it may be needful to give you a little previous information of my manner of life from my youth up to this present time. When I was about the age of fourteen years, God was pleased to show me that I was a sinner and that I must be born again before I could enter into the kingdom of heaven. Accordingly, I betook myself to reading, praying, fasting, and watching, and was enabled thereby to make some progress in sanctification. In this manner I went on, but not always with the same diligence, till about a year ago I thought myself in the way to heaven, though I was wholly out of it, and imagined I was travelling toward Zion, though I had never yet set my face thitherwards. Indeed, God had showed me that I was wrong by not owning my ministry, but I paid no regard to this for a long time, imputing my want of success to the naughty hearts of my hearers, and not my naughty doctrine. You may perhaps ask what was my doctrine. Why, dear sir, it was a doctrine every man will naturally hold, while he continues in an unregenerate state, viz. that we are to be justified partly by faith and partly by works of our own. This doctrine I preached for six years, at a curacy which I held for the college, and, though I took some extraordinary pains and pressed sanctification upon my hearers very earnestly, yet they continued as unsanctified as before, and not one soul was brought to Christ. There was very little of the form of religion in the parish, but not a whit of the power. At length I removed to Everton. Here I pressed sanctification and regeneration as vigorously as I could, but finding no success, after two years preaching in this manner, I began to be discouraged, and now some secret misgivings arose in my mind that I was not right myself. This happened about Christmas last. These misgivings grew strong, and at last very painful. Being under great doubts, I cried unto the Lord very earnestly. The constant language of my heart was, Lord, if I am right, keep me so. If I am not right, make me so, and lead me to the knowledge of the truth, as it is in Jesus. After about ten days crying to the Lord, he was pleased to return an answer to my prayers. As I was sitting and musing on a text of scripture one morning in my house, the following words were darted into my mind with wonderful power, and seemed indeed like a voice from heaven, Cease from thine own works. Before I heard these words, my mind was in a very unusual calm, but as soon as I heard them, my soul was in a tempest, and the tears flowed from my eyes like a torrent. The scales fell from my eyes immediately, and I saw clearly the rock I had been splitting upon for nearly thirty years. Do you ask me what this rock was? Why, it was some secret reliance on my own works for salvation." I had hoped to be saved partly by my own name and partly by Christ's name, though I am told there is salvation in no other name except the name of Jesus Christ. I had hoped to be saved partly by my own works and partly through the merits of Christ, though I am told we are saved by grace through faith and not of works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 I had hoped to make myself acceptable to God partly through my own good works, though we are told we are accepted through the Beloved, Ephesians 1, six. I had hoped to make my peace with God partly through my own obedience to His laws, though I am told that peace is only to be had by faith, Romans 5. I had hoped to make myself a child of God by sanctification, though I am told we are made children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, Galatians 3.26. I had thought that sanctification was the way to justification, but I now see that we must first be justified by faith before we can have any true sanctification by the Spirit. When we are justified, it is done freely and graciously, without the least merit of ours, and solely by the grace of God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 3, 24 and 28. 
All that is previously necessary to justification is this, that we be convinced by the Spirit of God of our own sinfulness. Isaiah 64, 6. Convinced that we are children of wrath by nature on account of our birth sin. Ephesians 2, 3 and that we are under the curse of God on account of our actual sin, Galatians 3.10, and under these convictions come to the Lord Jesus Christ, renouncing all our righteousness, Jeremiah 23.6. Again, Christ says, Come to me, all ye that are heavy laden with the burden of sin, and I will give you rest, that is, I will take the burden away, I will release you from the guilt of sin. Where you may observe the only thing required of us when we come to Christ is, to come burdened and sensible that none can remove our sins but Christ alone. Hear how he cries out in Isaiah 55, 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, come ye, buy wine and milk, which are the blessings of the gospel, without money and without price. Viz, we must not think to make a purchase of these blessings by any deserts of ours, they are offered freely, that is, graciously, and must be received freely. Nothing more is required of us but to thirst after them. Why was the Pharisee rejected? Luke 18.16 Because he came pleading his own works before God. He was devout, just, chaste, abstemious, and thanked God for enabling him to be so. Well, so far all was right. But he had some reliance on these works, and therefore he pleads the merit of them before God, which shows he did not know what a sinner he was, and that he could only be saved by grace through faith. He opens his mouth before God and pleads his own cause, because God declares that every mouth shall be stopped before him, and all the world be brought in guilty before God. Romans 3.19 And why was the publican justified? not on account of his good works, but because he was sensible of his evil ones, and accordingly came self-accused, self-condemned, and crying out for mercy. Dear sir, hear what is the rise and progress of religion in the soul of man. When the Spirit of God hath convinced any person that he is a child of wrath and under the curse of God, the heart of that person becomes broken for sin, and he feels what he never knew before, viz. that he hath not faith, and accordingly laments his evil heart of unbelief. In this state all men continue, some a longer, some a shorter time, till God is pleased to work faith in them. Then they are justified, and are at peace with God. Romans 5.1 They have their sins forgiven them, for this is the meaning of the word peace. Luke 7.48 and 50 When we have received faith from God, for it is his gift, Ephesians 2.9, to justify our persons, then afterwards we receive the Spirit to sanctify our nature, Ephesians 1.13, Galatians 3.14, and now the work of sanctification goes forward. We are more and more athirst for holiness, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now we are filled with joy and peace in believing, Romans 15.13. Now we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, 1 Peter 1, 8. Now we have the Spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, Romans 8, 16. These are strange things to believe, nay, things which everyone must be a stranger to till he is made a child of God in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But to proceed, though a believer is more and more sanctified in body, soul and spirit, Yet his hopes of heaven are not built on his sanctification, but on Christ by faith. Colossians 2.10 And that the moment he seeks to be justified by his own obedience to God's law, that moment he falls from grace. Galatians 5.4 Accordingly, though he labors to abound in all the fruits of righteousness, he does not rely on them, but on the righteousness of God by faith. Philippians 3.8 and 9 now let me point out this grand delusion which had liked to have deceived my own soul. I saw very early something of the unholiness of my nature and the necessity of being born again. Accordingly I watched, prayed, and fasted too, thinking by these means to purify my heart, whereas it can only be purified by faith. Acts 15.9 Watching, praying, and fasting are necessary duties, but I, like many others, 
placed some secret reliance on them, thinking they were to do much for me, in part at least which Christ only could do. The truth is, though I saw myself to be a sinner and a great sinner, yet I did not see myself an utter lost sinner, and therefore I would not come to Jesus Christ alone for salvation. I despised the doctrine of justification by faith alone, looking on it as a foolish and dangerous doctrine. I was not yet stripped of all my righteousness. I had not considered it as filthy rags, and therefore went about to establish a righteousness of my own, and did not submit to the righteousness of God by faith. Romans 10.3 I did seek for a righteousness through faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Thus I stumbled and fell. Romans 9.33 in short, to make use of a homely expression, I put the justice of God in the one scale and as many good works as I could in the other, etc. I always found my good works not to be a balance to the divine justice. I then threw in Christ as a make-weight, and this everyone does who hopes for salvation, partly by doing what he can for himself and then relying on Christ for the rest. But, dear sir, Christ will be a whole saviour or none at all, and if you have any good services of your own to recommend you to God, you are certainly without an interest in Christ, be you ever so serious, sober, just, and devout. You are still under the curse of God, and know it not, as I was, provided you have any allowed reliance on your own works, and think they are to do something for you, and Christ the rest. I now proceed to acquaint you with the success I have lately had in my ministry, as soon as God had opened my eyes and showed me the true way to salvation, I began to preach it, and I dealt with my hearers in a very different manner from what I used to do. I told them plainly they were children of wrath and under the curse of God, though they knew it not, and that none but Jesus Christ could deliver them from the curse. I asked them if they had ever broken the law of God once, in thought, word, or deed. If they had, then they were under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. And again, he that keepeth the whole law and yet offends in one point, he is guilty of all. If indeed we could keep the whole law without offending in one point, if we had done and could continue to do all things contained in God's law, then indeed we might lay claim to eternal life on the score of our own works, but who is sufficient for these things? If we break God's law, we immediately fall under the curse of it, and none can deliver us from the curse of it but Jesus Christ. There is an end forever after of any justification from our own works. No future good behavior can make any atonement for past miscarriages. If I keep all God's laws today, this is no amends for breaking them yesterday. If I behave peaceably to my neighbour this day, this is no satisfaction for breaking his head yesterday. If, therefore, I am once under the curse of God for breaking his laws, I can never after do anything of myself to deliver me from the curse. I may cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin and death? If I am once a sinner, nothing but the blood of Christ Jesus can cleanse me from sin, all my hopes are then in him, and I must flee to him as the only refuge set before me. In this manner, dear sir, I preached and do preach, laboring to beat down all self-righteousness, laboring to show unconverted sinners that they were in a lost and perishing condition, and that nothing could recover them out of this state, and make them children of God, but faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now see the consequence this was strange doctrine to my hearers. They were surprised, alarmed, and vexed. The old man, the carnal nature, was stirred up and railed at and opposed the truth. However, the minds of most were seized with some convictions, and the hearts of some were truly broken for sin, so that they came to me, as those mentioned in the Acts, thoroughly pricked to the heart, crying out with strong and bitter cries, "'What must I do to be saved?' I then laid the promises before them and told them if they found themselves under the curse, Christ was ready to deliver them from it. If they were really weary and heavy laden, Christ would give them rest. If their hearts were broken for sin and they would look to Christ, he would heal them. 
I exhorted them also to thank God for these convictions, assuring them that they were a token of good, for God must smite before he can heal. Isaiah 19.22 I daily found that they received comfort from the promises, and that, though they complained much of the burden of sin and of an evil heart of unbelief, yet they always went away comforted and refreshed. Many have come to me in this manner, and more are continually coming, and though some fall from their first convictions, yet others cleave steadfast to the Lord, they begin to rejoice in Him and to love Him. They love His word and meditate much on it. They exercise themselves in prayer and adorn their profession with a suitable life and conversation. And now let me make one reflection. I preached up sanctification very earnestly for six years in a former parish and never brought one soul to Christ. I did the same at this parish for two years without any success at all. But as soon as ever I preached Jesus Christ and faith in his blood, believers were added to the church continually. Then people flocked from all parts to hear the glorious sound of the gospel, some coming six miles, others eight and others ten, and that constantly. And now let me ask, what was the reason why my ministry was not blessed when I preached up salvation, partly by faith and partly by works? It was because this doctrine is not of God, and he will prosper no ministers but such as preach salvation in his appointed way, viz. by faith in Jesus Christ. Let me now apply myself to your own heart, and may God dispose you to receive my words in your spirit of meekness. Indeed, sir, I love and respect you, or else I could not have written to you so freely. Are you then in the same error that I was in for near forty years, viz. that you must be saved partly by faith and partly by works, and have you constantly reached this doctrine? Then you may certainly be assured of these two things. First, that you have never brought one soul to Christ, and secondly, that you are not in the way of salvation yourself. Oh, be not displeased with me for telling you the truth, but you will say perhaps that you have not only been sincere, but zealous in preaching the word of God. So was I, but there is a zeal which is not according to knowledge, and that zeal I had. You may say further that you have read and prayed much, so did I, but I still knew nothing, as I ought to know, till God was pleased to show me that I was blind. Then I cried heartily to him for light and direction. Dear sir, will you attend to the following advice? It is very safe advice. Be the state of your soul what it may. Pray to God to lead you to the knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. Beseech God to keep you in the truth if you have received it, or if you are in error, to reveal it unto you. If you will do this heartily and constantly, God will not suffer you to abide long in darkness, if indeed you are in darkness. I now proceed to give you some further account of myself. When I first came to the university, I applied myself diligently to my studies, thinking human learning to be a necessary qualification for a divine, and that none ought to preach unless he had taken a degree in the university. Accordingly, I studied the classics, mathematics, logic, philosophy, metaphysics, and read the works of our eminent divines, and this I did for twenty years and all the while was departing more and more from the truth as it is in Jesus, vainly hoping to receive that light and instruction from human wisdom which only could be had from the word of God and prayer. And, dear sir, during this time I was thought a Methodist by some people, only because I was a little more grave and took a little more pains in my ministry than some of my brethren, but in truth I was no Methodist at all, for... I had no sort of acquaintance with them, and could not abide them, nor their fundamental doctrine of justification by faith, and thought it high presumption in any to preach unless they had taken holy orders. But God was pleased to open my eyes about half a year ago. He showed me and taught me other things. Now I saw that nothing had kept me so much from the truth as a desire of human wisdom, now I perceived it was as difficult for a wise or learned man to be saved as it was for a rich man or a nobleman. 1 Corinthians 1.26 Now I saw that God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, 
and the weak things to confound the mighty, for two plain reasons, that no flesh should glory in his presence. 1 Corinthians 1, 29, 30 and 31, and to show that faith did not stand, nor was produced by the wisdom of man, by the power of God and by the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 5 and 12. Now I saw every believer was anointed by the Holy Ghost, and thereby led to the knowledge of all necessary truths. Now I saw that the Methodists' doctrine of justification by faith was the very doctrine of the gospel, and did no longer wonder at the success which those preachers met with. Whether they are clergy or laymen, they preach the doctrine of Christ, and Christ owns it, and many are added to the church daily. But you will say these Methodists are schismatics. Let us therefore examine this matter a little. A schismatic is one that dissents and divides from the established church, at least this is the general notion of schism. Now I ask you what you mean by a church, or what is it that makes one church differ from another? Schism consists in departing from the doctrine of a church, and not in the departing from the walls of a church. In the time of Sturbridge Fair, one sermon is always preached by a fellow of a college, or a clergyman at Cambridge. Now I would ask you, would you call this clergyman a schismatic? No, surely, and yet he preaches in the open fields and upon unconsecrated ground. It is plain, schism does not consist in preaching out of the walls of a church, but in preaching contrary to the doctrine of the gospel church. And now, dear sir, let me lay open my sin and shame to you. I solemnly subscribed to the articles of our church and gave my hearty consent to them. Amongst the rest I declared we are accounted righteous before God only for the merits of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, by faith and not for our works and deservings, that we are justified by faith only, as it is expressed in the eleventh article. But I solemnly subscribed to this article and never believed it, nor preached it, but preached salvation partly by faith and partly by works. And, oh, what dreadful hypocrisy was this! I called and thought myself a churchman, though I was a dissenter and a schismatic, for I was far from the fundamental doctrine of our church, and the fundamental doctrine of the gospel, namely justification by faith only, and dreadful was my case. And yet, I fear, it is the case of most of the clergy of England, scarce any preach but justification by faith and works, and what is the consequence? Why, there is scarce any true religion amongst us. Look around the parishes where you live, and see whether you can find anything besides the form of religion, and not much of that. Nay, amongst those that are thought religious people, who are sober, just, and devout, who read, pray, and give alms, you will scarcely find any one that knows anything of the power of religion, and has the experimental knowledge of it. For, ask such people, in the very words of Scripture, whether they know that Jesus Christ is in them, 2 Corinthians 13, whether they have received an unction from the Holy One, 1 John 2, 20, whether the love of God hath been shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost, and do they rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, whether the Holy Spirit bears witness with their spirit that they are the children of God, Romans 8, 14 and 15. I say, if you should ask the better sort of them these questions, they would stare at you with the utmost amazement, and would think you an enthusiast, if they would not call you so. Now such people as have a form of religion but none of the power, who are outwardly reformed but not inwardly renewed by the Holy Ghost, our Saviour calls whited sepulchres, beautiful without but full of rottenness within. They are striving to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but are not able, because they do not strive lawfully, for they do not seek to enter in by Jesus Christ, but partly by Christ and partly by themselves, partly by faith and partly by works. These are almost, but not altogether, Christians, and if at any time any among them happen to be seized with deep convictions, and are made sensible of their lost estate and of their utter need of Christ, and that they can only be justified by faith in his blood. These people, not finding proper food for their souls in our churches, are obliged to go somewhere else, and seek it where they can find it. It is no wonder, therefore, that there are so few zealous Christians. 
If you read the works of the good old bishops that were published a hundred years ago, you will there find the gospel of Christ preached, but since that time, I mean in the last century, our clergy have been gradually departing more and more from our doctrinal articles and homilies, so that at length there is scarce a clergyman to be found, but who preaches contrary to the articles he subscribed. And almost all the sermons that have been published in the last century are full of that soul-destroying doctrine that is preached by bishops and curates, that we are to be justified partly by our own works and partly by Christ's merits. Do you ask how all the clergy came to fall into this pernicious doctrine? I answer very easily. Every man, while he continues under the power of a carnal mind and is not awakened to see his utter lost condition, is naturally disposed to embrace this doctrine, for, not being convinced by the Spirit of God that all his righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6, and that he is without help and strength in himself, Romans 5, 6, and 11, 6, I say, not being convinced of this, he naturally goes about to establish some righteousness of his own, and cannot submit to the righteousness of God by faith, not being sensible yet of his lost and helpless state, he must have some reliance on himself, and instead of looking wholly to Christ for salvation, he looks partly to Christ and partly to himself. Instead of seeking for righteousness and strength from the Lord Jesus Christ, he seeks them partly from Christ and partly from himself. Instead of seeking to be justified in the law, he seeks to be justified partly through the Lord and partly through himself. But see what Christ says of this matter. Isaiah 45, 22-25 and now let me ask how the whole church of Rome happened to depart from the gospel simplicity and to fall into this doctrine of works and faith which we preach. It was owing to the depraved nature of man which makes him think himself to be something, and that he can do something, though he is nothing, and can do nothing to justify himself in God's sight. At the Reformation our church returned to Jesus Christ, again placed justification on the gospel footing of faith only, and so it continues to this day. But though our articles continue sound, and our homilies evangelical, yet our clergy have once more departed from both, and are advancing to Rome again with hasty strides, preaching in spite of articles and subscription that most pernicious, papistical and damnable doctrine of faith and works but I trust God is once more visiting in mercy our poor distressed church. He raised up Mr. Whitfield and Mr. Wesley about twenty years ago who have courageously and successfully preached up this doctrine of our church, and he is daily raising up more and more clergymen. At Christmas last I was informed there were forty clergymen who were brought to the acknowledgement of the truth and three more have been added to the faith within the last six weeks, and oh, forever adored be the mercy of God for opening mine eyes and leading me to the knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. I have sent you two books and a pamphlet, and I make you a present of them. Read them over carefully, and before you begin to read at any time, look up to the fountain of wisdom for light and direction, for if you rely on your own ability or other men's labours, God may keep you ignorant of his glorious gospel as a punishment for your presumption and neglect of him. When I sat down to write, I did not intend to fill more than half a sheet, but when I took pen in hand, I knew not how to lay it aside. I have written my sentiments with great freedom and hope without offence. May God give a blessing to what I have written, May he enlighten your eyes as he has done mine. Adored be his name. May he lead you to the knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus, and make you instrumental in bringing souls out of darkness into light, and translating them out of the kingdom of Satan into the glorious kingdom of his dear Son. Amen. Amen. Wishing you the best of blessings, I remain your affectionate brother and servant in the Lord Jesus Christ, John Berridge. On Conversion by John Berridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.